Ooh, am I on the right profile? Yeah, I think I am. Okay. Uh, name rush. We got this, we got this. What do you want to do today? Plug my phone in. Alrighty. So, where we left off. Let's see, load up my tool. Streaming Medieval Zombie Book 3. Now what I think I want to do today is give this book a rest and we'll start working on him in context. Did I leave those eyes on there? Yeah, I guess I did. Alrighty. Hey there, Oleg. Thanks for showing up. Let me get some more hot tea. Mmm. Hopefully that make my voice sound a little bit better. I know it can be raspy first thing in the morning. Um... Okay, uh, so if I want to use this as a prop in something else that I'm making, what I will do, I mean, I'll keep it all separate and not, it's not really nice necessarily, but you know, we got separate sub tools in here, but if I just want to use this as a placeholder for something that I want to create uh, in a larger scene, I'm going to go over here to sub tool, merge visible, and that's going to merge all of these things into a one sub tool right here. And now if I want to just simplify this, uh, right now we're at 250,000 active points. I'm just going to dynamesh this thing to give it uh, just all one solid envelope like so. Uh, make sure there's no any real um, any real uh, bad holes or anything like that. If you do, and I noticed that on my streaming topics here, um, Axel um, asked me if there was a way to dynamesh an object to get rid of super small holes that you create. Um, usually that's just based on your resolution. Now the problem is if you drop your resolution down and then you dynamesh, you're going to start losing detail. But what you can do is, um, if I duplicate this off, and let's say we got some small holes in here and I want to dynamesh this lower, um, you can dynamesh this at a lower resolution and then use subtool project to project this back, and then you can subdivide this up and project back. So you can kind of dynamesh to close your holes, and then you can project back to get the details. Um, there might be some issues in here, you know, where the dynamesh starts squishing all this together. Um, another option now that we have is Tessimate. This won't close your holes. Dynamesh will Tessimate. Um, we'll just update your geometry. Uh, we can show you that. So let's hit OK. Turn on Polyframe. And so we got this thing here, and I'm going to duplicate it off. So you're going to see Dynamesh gives you nice even quads all over the place. And then now if you, in ZBrush 2018, if you go down here to Geometry, Tessimate, um, you're going to have a Tessimate option, and then you can choose um, your Tessimation polygon size here, and that'll kind of dial in your densi <laughs> density and possibly crash ZBrush. Don't go too low. Um, let me restart ZBrush there. So that would be the Tessimate option. Sorry, my phone's yelling at me. Hey, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Oh, it's too early in the morning. How do you guys... Do? Well, you guys are probably aren't... You might be in a time zone different than mine. I am just going to be dragging today, I have a feeling. Anyway, when you hit the comma key, um, you'll have a recovered Z tools. I didn't really lose anything. It's kind of annoying that it crashed. And then we'll go back here. We got our two sub tools here. So we got the test mate one. We'll go ahead and delete that. And we have our merged Dynamesh one. Mmm. Honey and lemon. Okay, so this is what I'll be using for my prop. If I want to go even lower than this, it's still at 100,000. Um, of course, all we have to do is Z plugin, Decimation Master, preprocess current. Mm, wait for it, and then we'll drop this down to like 10K. Now, if you want to retain all of your details, you can go over here and just go like, okay, 25k decimate current. Um, you don't have to pre-process every time. Uh, this is like the Houdini poly reducer, where once you process it once, you can just drag the slider and update it. Um, that'd be cool if ZBrush had that functionality, if I could just drag this thing around once it's processed. Um, but you can just type in maybe 50k, and this will give you all the detail that you want and drop all the detail off. So, are all the polygons down. So I think this will be a good book, and then uh, since we loaded up the recovered Z tool, we didn't we didn't have our original left in there, so that's fine. And now I can just use this as a prop for what I think we're going to be doing today. Um, but we'll see. Uh, Money says, "Hey, Mike, a little off topic, but do you think you could get into some Houdini SOP for modeling a particular hard surface?" Um, I can't just not because 
you can't do it, not because it can't be done, but just because I literally can't. Um, I've never used Houdini for modeling at all. So, but that's something I want to get into because I think, eh, especially concepting in Houdini, the ability to just quickly, you know, mock together shapes and parameters to get you kind of an overall thing that you want to make and maybe go through some iterations in Houdini using those tools and then dumping that into like a ZBrush or a Maya or motor or whatever to do the final modeling might be a cool way to go to kind of dip my toe into a hard surface or just any sort of modeling in Houdini. Uh, uh, um, yeah, this will be saved up on my YouTube channel. So if you guys aren't familiar, go to my YouTube channel here. I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you right, you know what? I'll send you home. Um, 2005. That's me. I don't know why it shows that name. Mike Pavlovich, 2005. I guess that's when I made it. Whoa. There we go. There's the right one. Let me back that chat off there. Good morning, Chang. Thanks for showing up. Hey, everybody. Uh, were the UVs you created in Houdini tutorial series the one you used for the final textured render? Yes. Um, if you want to see them, I guess we can load that up in Painter. I think I still have it around. It's been a while. I didn't. I didn't touch them. I'm way too lazy for that. Um, the Houdini game series is about taking some oh, new version. Let's go ahead and download that. Uh, the Houdini game series is about taking something you've created externally and bringing it in and using that as a way to make your game res, UVs, normals, vertex normals, uh, exporting those in FBX, baking your maps. Um, that's what that series is about. And honestly, I think that's surprisingly setting up an entire workflow for my game development. Uh, was is probably easier for me personally than going in there and going okay let's make a cube and let's extrude a face and then let's round an edge or let's bevel a corner because that gets into well if I just want to model something and block something out I don't need a node based system for that um, it does come in handy if you want to do that um, if you want to you know this the tutorials that you'll see is like a bunch of columns that you can you can make a bunch of columns and then spread those out and make those all like instances of each other so you can update them all on the fly. Um, modeling procedurally in ways that it makes sense like that or making an entire level based on a... Um, and Louise Cruel, I, mean, I, I can link you guys to that. Give me a second. Cruel Vimeo. So if you go to Louise Cruel on Vimeo, he's got some game... This is the stuff I was watching for the game dev stuff, but also... AI driven level with bots weapons, uh, maps from image with elevation, auto creation, um, all of this stuff. So I'm gonna link you guys here and you can like dig through here and that might give you some ideas, but I'm not quite there yet as far as modeling in Houdini. I've been I'm 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 too set in my ways, and that's not true. I'm not set in my ways, I just haven't dived into Houdini for modeling yet. Yeah, and uh, as far as the textile density, um, powdery mirror, um, <laughs> I guess a powdery mirror is what I would use for photogrammetry. Um, I it, it is, you, but it is low textile density, but if you had like say a mirrored object, what you can do is you can do like a clip and then do UVs on one side and then mirror it on the other and then bake uh, accordingly. Um, I'll do a, I'll do a walkthrough on that maybe. Um, as soon as I figure that out, and that'll be good. Let's see if I can, there we go, drag these things together. Sorry. Um, and also, I was going to be doing some anatomy and posing and some skeleto skeletal skeletor guys with armor and stuff, so I loaded up my armor reference, and boy, I had a lot of armor reference. So it's sitting here at the bottom of my screen. Um, I might have to do some really boring sorting through here. Um, you guys might have to talk amongst yourselves. Or we can just, I don't know, post them out and have fun. Um, in Houdini 6.5 Motion Path for animation looks cool. Do you know that Houdini use, if Houdini use, can use Maya Rigs? Houdini can pretty much do anything. It's just a matter of setting it up to, you know, parse through that information so you have joints and um, all that stuff. Animation is way out of my purview, unfortunately, right at this moment. But I'm always learning. 
Yeah, and Houdini could be really good for uh, set design and layout, and certainly for level design, so check out those videos, and that might, uh, like I said, give you some ideas. So, we've got our prop here, and now let's think about a couple different ways where we can make a character uh, and pose it out, but, you know, since we're doing zombie characters, something like, uh, it's like this Braum uh, painting here, I love Braum, um, you know, where they might be kind of goopy and their flesh is kind of weathered away and they've got stringy um, clothing and stuff like that. So if we are going to be digging into a person, uh, what I'm thinking might be easiest is if we have a fully fleshed person and we put a skeleton inside them and just kind of wear away at their body and un unveiling the skeleton. Or we can take a skeleton and then put flesh on top of that. Either way is doable. Um, there's pros and cons to both of them. Um, but I'm gonna, let's, let's see what we can do here. So for posing a character, let's hit the comma key here. I'm going to go into our tools and we've got the Nick Z humanoid. We can start there. You can start with any of these humans. Also under project, you might have, I guess you got the demo soldier. Let's stick with, for now, we'll start with the Nick Z humanoid and we're going to see if we can't start out fancy. So I'm going to take this guy. He already has a skull in him, which is nice. We'll keep that skull, I think. Uh, the eyes we won't need, and the floor we won't need, but the eye, the skull we can use, and the body we can use. We're going to have to put another skeleton in him, so I'm going to hit the comma key again. Go over here to Ryan Kingsline's anatomy model. Now this one we could pose out, and we're going to do multiple characters, so and we could even do a female, or multiple females, or it could be all female cast, doesn't matter, whatever you want to do. But we can take this one and pose it out as well. And this one will already have muscles, so you know what, let's let's do that. Let's say, I'm going to do a merge visible. And that's going to give us uh, just a merged one. Now, so this one has muscles and bones and like little tendons and stuff, so that'll be nice. And then Nick Z has just a skull. And then if we take this one and we do delete other, now we're left with just a skeleton. So what we can do is we can take this Nick Z humanoid, append that skeleton, and with that skeleton selected, see how he's, if we turn these both on, see how he's really tiny at the bottom here? I'm going to go down here to Deformation and hit Unify, and then I'll go ahead and make him fit the bounding box of the Nick Z model. And then I'm going to turn on Transparency, and let's go ahead and stuff, hold down Alt, and move that gizmo down towards the bottom here, and we'll just kind of stick the skeleton in here. So now the skull, Nick Z, Nick Zuccarello, look him up. Um, he's already got in there, so the skull I don't really need. Let's see if that skull has teeth. Yes, it does. So, we'll go ahead and hold down Control shift grab a lasso, and we're going to grab the front part of the skull, the teeth, and the jaw. Hit Control shift a to grow visibility, Control shift drag to invert visibility, delete hidden, and now we're all set up. So, um, if I turn his bones off, we have this, his skull sitting on top of her skeleton. Um, the male skeleton, let's see, let me get out of that mode, there we go. Um, so, how do I know this is a female skeleton? Well, we have uh, a rib cage here that's a little narrower, about two fingers on both sides than the rib cage. The pelvis uh, tends to be tilted more and a little more flared out at the front here. So if we wanted to make this a little more boxier and a little more narrow. Now, what I'm doing here is making the pelvis as narrow as the rib cage, but really what would probably happen is this rib cage here. Let's see if we can isolate. Let's see what polygroups we have. Let's do an auto groups and then a mirror and weld. And we'll just do a real quick cleanup here. I'm going to grab again with my select lasso all these pieces here, control shift A, and then we can get rid of the clavicles here. Hit control W and now my Rib cage is all in one tool, or one polygroup here, so we'll hit W, hold down Control and tap, and we'll hit X to go out of X symmetry, and then we'll put that in the middle. So now we can, probably what'll happen is this rib cage will be wider, and then this pelvis here, and for this one, let's go ahead and simplify this as well. We'll take that pelvis and that sacrum in the back, mask that out, and then we'll make this as about the same width. And that tilt is actually not bad. You know, I would say female would be more tilted forward. Um, that's fine for a male. Good enough. Okay, so 
they've made this skeleton slightly more male. Uh, I wonder, just thinking about it, let's see if, yeah, we might have to pull in a little bit more brow ridge and stuff like that. And well, so his skeleton that we have in our body here is this one. So if we look at this guy, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so this one just a little bit more simplified. The um, Ryan King's line is a little bit more triangulated. So uh, we've got the skeleton, we've got the skull. Let's go ahead and merge these both down. And now we've got a skeleton sitting inside of the Nick Z human male. Um, in order to pose a little bit easier and make a little bit easier selections, uh, Nick Z has this thing uh, set up with polygroups, which is nice. I'm gonna go ahead and go down here to layer so we can sculpt on it. Um, you know, if you don't know, you can move these arms up and down, side to side, um, wee, and then mouth open. So any of these, uh, I guess, arms, there we go. So these two don't play nice together, obviously. But we'll go ahead and keep that mouth closed, and we'll do arms out. Just all these are defaults are fine, and then we'll hit bake all. And now I can do a quick mirror and weld. We'll make polygroups the same on both sides. And now let's make this skeleton match. So I'm going to select that skeleton here, turn the body on, go into transparency mode. Now if I just want to move these arms around, let's just grab, I guess it's easier with the select lasso here. Hit X to go across X symmetry. Control Shift A, mask, invert, oops. And then we can just move this pivot right in here. There we go, close enough. And then same thing for the legs and uh, you know, we're dealing with a lot of bones down here on the toes. That's why I'm using this lasso method. Perfect. Not too shabby. Let me get another drink here. How do you solve Gozi opening multiple instances of Maya? I've moved files and posted on the forms, but still opens a new instance. Thanks. Um, I don't use Gozi with Maya. Um, off the top of my head. Yeesh. Um, I think he, do, 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 hit this hit this R over here. That'll reset your Go Z and maybe walk through the setup again. It's kind. I know it's kind of the solution of Have you tried turning your computer on and off? But uh, that's all I can think of in the morning. I'm not an expert at Go Z for sure. It's only not Go Z with Maya. Cool, no problem, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Um, anything of X said, Mike on the Earthworm Gym, you made two layers of the eyes. Can you tell me, did you use primitive projection or different method? Thanks. I think at the beginning, what I did, let me see if I have a version of him that's older. Load Z to editing source video. Um, do I not? Oh, I've got him. Where's he at? Let me think, 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 think. Give me a second. Let me copy this directory here. Oh, I'm under recording. Stupid. Okay. Yeah, we're not under recording. We're under streaming. Arthur Jam. Uh, so three. Let's see what three has in it. Nope, that's still too new. Let's go to delete all. Let's see what two has in it. Still too new. And this, this only took me about four hours, so I don't have a whole lot of iterative saves, as you can see. Yeah, of course not. Okay, so this is as far back as I can go on this head here in particular. But what we can do, we can re kind of recreate that. So if I, let's delete all. And then load up Earthworm Jim. So here's Earthworm Jim. Go out of Solomon. So this is that Earthworm Gym speed sculpt. So what we have is um, two layers of eyes here. And the reason I made two layers of eyes is so that when we go into, oh yeah, we're supposed to be installing some, hold on just a second. Download Substance Painter. Come on. All right, well that's spinning. Uh, there it goes. So now, um, Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So we've got our eyeballs here, 
and we've got a pupils mesh here. Let me shoot all these to the top and hold down shift and just shoot all of these relevant meshes to the top here and this one here. So I'm just going to look at our eyeball meshes. So this outer eyeball here is what I'm going to, what I ended up putting like glass or liquid on top of just to make it super shiny. And then underneath that we have, so this is the over one, this is the under one. We'll turn that off. Underneath that, we have uh, this shape here, which is just a uh, concave version of that. It's a little bit smaller so that you can put in the color of the eye and then the pupil of the eye. Um, we can do a demo on how to make that. It's pretty simple. And then uh, with all these layers on here, then you can throw that into Keyshot and render it out. Um, I guess we could load that up too while we're thinking about it. Uh, think, think, think. Uh, it got rid of it, did it not? Okay, I have to put that back in there. Um, ever considered doing a tutorial on series Moi 3D? Yeah, sure, right after I learn it. That's one of those, I use Fusion 360, and I've looked at Moi 3D. Um, looks cool, but I don't do a whole lot of asset creation anymore. Uh, so it takes me a little bit longer than it used to. Used to be, oh yeah, I'm just making a bunch of assets, so let me sit down and just use it today while I make assets. Um, unfortunately, I don't just sit down and make a bunch of assets anymore. For better or for worse. Maybe someday again. Uh, hold on just a second, this goes way down there. Okay, so here's the Earthworm Gym set up. So if we zoom in here, let's get rid of this animation here at the bottom. And let's go to our view image resolution presets. Let's turn off lock aspect. Get rid of that and geometry view. There we go. Okay, so what I was talking about was basically we have this over eyeball right here, and that's going to catch a specular. And then this is assigned to just a glass material. And then we got the color of the eye here and the pupil and the white of the eye underneath. So you have a little bit more control over how that renders. Let's go ahead and pause that. And then in here, um, I want to say at first, ooh, at first what I did was use the insert primitive mesh. So if this was, let's go ahead and say geometry, um, let's just Dynamesh this here. Okay, so here's my block out concept -y sculpt. Actually, well, yeah, okay, let's undo that. Let's do it this way. So I'm going to go down to subdivision level 1, delete higher. And now if we have, like, say, our standard brush on and we have Sculptress mode on, uh, we're able to sculpt and just dynamically subdivide or tessellate, I should say, where our object uh, has detail. So as you can see, this is very low res. And if I go in here and I try to sculpt, it's going to give me more geometry where I want to sculpt with a smaller brush, which allows me, and you can even use the shift key. So you can smooth in these areas where you want more resolution. And then you can go through here and sculpt higher resolution just in the areas that you want to. Uh, same thing goes for poly paint. If I turn sculptor's mode off, I'm in the standard brush here and we have RGB turned on. And we say, let's fill this with a white. And then we can go in here and we can start coloring. You're going to see where I was tessellating here. It's going to be very high resolution, but when I go out here, it's going to be very low resolution because this is just vertex color. Just poly paint is vertex color. It's based on uh, how many vertices you have you available to paint on. So you can see it's very low res out here. And it's very high res in here. So if you have sculptures mode turned on, and that's the, if you hover over this, that's like a backslash key on your keyboard. You can reassign that however you'd like. Um, so now when I have that on, in the, even in these low res areas, I can paint at a very high resolution, just make your brush smaller. And the problem, that's not a problem. Uh, something you may run into is it'll kind of skip here. That's something we ran into on the ZBrush live stream. Essentially, you need a vertice in there for it to kind of allow it to tessellate more. Um, so what you can do is you can hold down shift and smooth over the area, and then you can go through and paint. So it won't do that skipping. You can see even in this low res areas, I'm able to do a very high resolution uh, poly paint. So, uh, but we'll go ahead and turn poly paint off. 
and we can continue sculpting. So we're sculpting in here. And the other cool thing about tessellating or tessimating is you can go through here and you can just like shift smooth through an object and just get rid of it. So if you wanted to just make him into a nub head, you can do that. And then you can go back in here with your snake hook and it'll automatically dynamically as you're dragging out, continue to tessellate out. You can make your brush size smaller and smaller and you can just continuously without having to re-dynamesh just do this kind of stuff. So you can go back into your, like say spiral brush is a fan favorite. Um, and go through here and you can hold down alt and you can just continuously go through here and you can make these smaller so that you get more resolution. So as you're making these shapes, it's giving you more resolution like so. Uh, let's go ahead and drag back through our undo history. So let's say we had our earthworm gem head as just a little nubbin. Uh, you can also use the snake hook two, which is going to be based on your normal angle. So as I'm like wiggling on this object, it's actually, it doesn't look like it's doing anything, but if you go to the side, you're going to see it's coming straight at me from the camera. So you can kind of just kind of wiggle that out at you as opposed to snake hook, which is just going to move. We use it like a move brush here. So you can kind of just go through here and you can very quickly just dial in what you need to do anyway. Uh, long story short, er, let's go ahead and take our snake hook here and we'll just pull this out and we'll use our inflate and then we'll use our smooth and now we've got an earthworm gym head. Let's go in here with our Damien standard here and start dialing in somewhere we want these wrinkles to go here and then you go into your standard brush and again we're just starting up, oh, we have RGB turned on, there we go. We're just starting the block out of our character because we had a low resolution geometry and we're kind of treating it like uh, just a arbitrary geometry resolution subdividing thing to sculpt on. Um, the cool thing about that is I don't have to dynamesh this. If I dynamesh this, if you watch this area in here and you turn on dynamesh, you're going to see it's going to suck these pieces together, which is good in a lot of instances where you want an envelope. But if you don't want that, if you just uh, keep dynamesh off and you use sculptress mode, you can go through here, and if we want to make this a little bit easier to work on, I'm going to hit uh, W, hold down Control and drag. We'll hit Control W, make that one polygroup, and now I can just get in here and sculpt, or I can uh, hit W, Control tap this one and mask it, and now I can just go through here and you know sculpt on this side and just leave this side alone here. Uh, so with that, we can go through here and we can add more resolution. And as we're moving this stuff around and it's getting you know, bumping into each other, or we take, for instance, like I was doing on my oct octopus sculpt, taking this end here and kind of wrapping it around. Um, let's go ahead and again, we'll just invert that, hit Control W. And now that I have this polygroup here, we can hit W, Control tap this one, and now we'll leave the other pieces alone. And let's go ahead and like wrap this around in here. There we go. And then again, go back in with our inflate and then smooth it out. Nice. So, and then we don't have to dynamesh and these things will always stay separate because they're not dynameshed. They're uh, dynamic tessellation. So we've got this here. Uh, and then for the eyeballs, if we go ahead and smooth this out back to the original, let me go in here with our clay brush here. So here's our base sculpt here. We go back in and just kind of make this plain Jane here, smooth brush. So we got sculpture mode turned on. Uh, so we would do we were doing like a project primitive to get this basic shape out. And it was initially it was two versions of the project primitive. So what I will do is hit um, W, uh, go in here to our project primitive. And by default, we just have a project primitive sitting in there. So if I move this around, you're going to see it's going to be projecting by default a sphere in there. So let's go ahead and uh, we can scale this thing down and move this thing around here. And then wherever I put this thing, it's gonna project kind of the eyeball size through. So we'll go ahead and scale this out. Um, if I'm happy with this placement, uh, that's where I'm going to tap the accept here. And then we can just move out another one. You can do this in symmetry too, but since he's not symmetrical, no point in doing that. And now we've got another eyeball here. So if I'm happy with these, I can accept that. And now what I can do is I can shrink this ball down and then I can pull this out. And as I escape from that ball, it's going to leave a hole here. So I can kind of move this here and I'm going to scale this up 
here and we can kind of just have this ball and I'm going to also, if I want to see it while I'm using it, what I'm going to temporarily do is go over here to the new surface and turn that up to one and now I've just got a new surface sitting in here so I can use this as just an eyeball to put in there but first if I want to subtract from this eyeball here what I can do is now let's turn new surface off and now we can kind of punch in a hole where we want that so we can accept that one and then we can go over here and we can rotate this around again just put new surface on so we can see what we're doing yay good enough and then new surface off there we go so we got the holes there and then if we want to make a new project primitive you would go okay so I want to accept this one and then uh, new surface now we would turn new surface on for our eyeball so we just have a um, an eyeball here but what I want to do with this one in particular is let's go back to the gear and let's hit full reset so now we have um, an eyeball sitting in here we'll go back to new surface one and then we can just punch this eyeball wherever we want and this is making a completely new eyeball so we can just scale this whoops scale this in stick it in there scale it down like so and then if I like this one, we can hit accept and then move it over. Now, obviously, this is like Earthworm Jim's um, interesting looking brother. <laughs> it's not how his eyeballs look, but you get the idea where you would, you know, spend a little bit more time sculpting and then doing these project primitives to get the uh, look that you're going for. Uh, but that's a basic idea. And then if we're completely happy with this, let's go ahead and shrink this down just a little bit. There we go. Uh, we can go, okay. Uh, we can accept that or we can say okay we're good and now we can jump out of that mode and now we have two eyeballs sitting in there so we hold down control shift we can go here's one eyeball here's the other eyeball um, now what I ended up doing to have those sculptable eyeballs is let's go ahead and delete those it's a little bit easier for me just to go in here with like a sphere 16 and the reason I like this one is because it has the polarized caps which is good for eyeballs so in this case um, instead of zero meshing those eyeballs, which I could have done, I wouldn't have given me this uh, version here. So I can just hold down W and control drag. And now we have two versions of eyeballs sitting in here. And <laughs> those are wonky. Let's go ahead and split those off. And then just really quickly, let's, uh, in fact, I would just do one eyeball like this and duplicate it over, I think, is what I would do. But in order to create that eyeball I was talking about, what I would do is I would duplicate this one off. And then I'm going to do Q mesh polygroup all, hold down shift and just kind of pull it out a little bit. Let's alt mark these ones here. And then we'll say delete polygroup all. And then we're going to go to close convex hole. And then as we pull this out, we can kind of round this surface off. So we have a lens sitting over here. Let's hit control W and let, oops, let's make that more obvious. And now let's do a crease PG. So I'll go ahead and crease around our polygroups. So now when we hit D for dynamic, it'll smooth here. And now we have a nice uh, lens. So we can do like a smooth subdivision level of three, crease level of two. And that'll kind of blend that out. Or maybe smooth subdivision level of four, crease level of three. Something like that. Um, looks like we're getting some nasty pinching on. And this thing with that polarized end here. So what you could do is you could just zero mesh that area. Um, you could also just build in a little bit more of an edge loop. Let's insert another single edge loop here. Uh, on the other eyeball, so I duplicated this one off. Here's our other eyeball sitting inside there. We need this to be concave here. So let's go ahead and mark this area out. And again, we'll just say delete polygroup all. Now, if I go through here and I say close convex hole, that's going to just push it out. There's no way to push that in. What you can do is go down here to display properties flip and now that our normals are flipped when we close this convex hole it'll go inwards and then just flip them back so now you've got one sitting inside here um, if you want a copy of this to make colorized all you need to do is you can you can do q whoops q mesh polygroup ball and you can hold down control and make a copy of it like that uh, what i usually end up doing and you can increase polygroup on this one as well uh, i'll just duplicate this off isolate this delete hidden and then we'll just Q mesh polygroup all this way. And now we can do, yeah, make sure it's not double. So now you've got the color of your eyeball. And now for the um, 
black part of your eyeball. Let's duplicate this off. Let's do a delete hidden, and we'll just take this little piece right here, and then we'll say delete hidden again, control W, and then we'll just Q mesh this out. And now we have multi-layered eyeball, pupil, color, eyeball, and then the lens part. Makes sense. Uh, try to import an STL file and get unable to open STL file. Maybe know what requirements ZBrush makes to STL files and why mine doesn't open. Uh, I'm not an expert on that either, unfortunately. Um, so if you want to import an STL just for everybody else, under Z plugin, there is a 3D print hub and there is an uh, STL import here. Here's import options. Um, you're right though, if you're getting something off GrabCAD, it may or may not depending on how they built it and exported it and the export settings from that program. Um, I haven't had any problems with STLs from Fusion 360, but that's the only program I've exported STL files from. But I have had problems like taking someone else's CAD data just randomly off the internet as an STL file that they made and ZBrush not liking it. But uh, technically, I don't know what ZBrush is looking for or why it would fail. Uh, how can I add new meshes into an already created insert mesh brush? That's a pretty easy one. Go over here to brush, create, and then you can copy from another insert mesh brush and paste it in there if you want to. Or uh, let's say we wanted to say, let's hit, um, let's say B, create insert mesh new. So now we have a new insert mesh brush. If I wanted to make this an insert mesh brush, I'll just hit B, create insert mesh append and then skip this note. So now you've got these two. Uh, you can also, if you have a bunch of things in here, like, um, let's go ahead and say, let's merge all these down and then we'll clone it. And then on this clone, we'll say split to parts, just to get up. I'm just looking for a bunch of subtools basically. And then down here under deformations, we'll say unify, and then repeat to other, hit F to frame. And now all of our subtools are stacked here. You're gonna wanna make sure they're rotated however you wanna drag them out on your canvas. Then you can just hit B, create insert multi mesh, and now you have multiples. And then I can go back to this one here, and I can say copy one mesh. And I think I can go back here and say, paste append and that'll throw it right there at the back end here. I can do paste insert or paste replace. Um, I think there's another, oh, you can do from mesh. That might make, let me try that one. Yeah, so uh, instead of hitting B, create insert mesh append, you can just do this from mesh button and that'll just keep adding uh, more here. Uh, speaking incidentally, uh, you can also go in here to the IMM extractor so if you like, um, say, let's just grab something that's simple so we're not sitting here all day. Mm -hmm. IMM, eh, that's too simple. Let's say industrial parts. So we got industrial parts like, let's say, insert mesh brush to subtools. That'll put all of these subtools here, or all of these brush pieces here into one subtool. So you can go through here and you can say, ah, I don't want the flathead, but I want two versions of this cotter pin. So I'm gonna duplicate this. And on this cotter pin here, I want it to be a long cotter pin. So now we've got all of these sitting in here. Now you can hit again B, create insert multi mesh, and now you've got a new version of this brush with a long cotter pin. And of course, make sure you rename it. Um, <laughs> do you know that Gozi files pile up somewhere on your C drive and you have to delete them manually? I cleaned up yesterday 25 gig. I didn't know that, but let's go to preferences, go Z, clear cache files, should do that as well, um, I think. But good point, that's something I don't really think about. Uh, I don't have bounding box relative checkbox. Ah, uh, no, that should be out by now, I'll ask them. Um, I was using a newer version. Um, you can probably get it off GitHub right now if you wanted to. But um, I'll see where that's at. That's what's today? Wednesday? I don't even know what today is. Thursday. Jeez. Time flies when you're having fun, man. Um, I'll follow up on that. 
Uh, yeah, I'll see what's up with that. Sorry about that. Hey, Garrett. Thanks for showing up. Uh, as a way to snap a stroke to an axis or draw a perfectly straight line, is it possible with Substance Painter by shift clicking? Um, yeah, and that's the default, in fact. If you go into Sphere 3D, make Polymesh 3D. Subdivide, subdivide. Um, oh, you know what? It might not be the default anymore now, now that I say that. Um, so we got our standard brush here. And then if we hold down um, Shift, uh, it's going to do this. But however, if you have your um, lazy mouse turned on and then you hold down Shift, you're going to get that line just like Painter. And if you don't want that functionality, then turn lazy mouse off. That's just L to toggle that on and off. And then you can hold down Shift. And it's all camera based. Uh, difference between mirror and weld and mirroring with subtool master. Uh, mirroring with subtool master, I believe, is just doing a deformation mirror, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, it's been a while since I've used subtool master for much of anything. Let me see what it does. Mirror visible subtools. Merge into one subtool. Okay, so append as new subtool. Yeah, I don't think this does a mirror and weld operation. I think it just does a mirror operation on multiple subtools. You can also nowadays use the repeat it to mirror. Um, you can record you mirroring and then save that and say mirror visible. Might be another one. Use adaptive size and combine operation of Sculptors Pro, or do you have it turned off and just rely on subdivide size and slider instead? As of this recording, um, I have it just on the default. So underneath stroke here, you're going to see um, Sculptures Pro, and then if we turn that on, uh, you're going to see we have adaptive size, combined, subdivide size, and undivide ratio. Um, if you hover over any of these, you can hold down control, and it'll give you more information on that. Uh, if you make these both even, when you hold down shift to smooth, it will, oh, we have, okay, delete lower. Actually, you know what? Let's delete higher. So when you hold down shift to smooth, uh, and you have Sculptures turned on, um, it'll tessellate at a at the same resolution as you're sculpting. By default, the undivide ratio is what, at 1.25 or something? When you hold down shift to smooth, it will tessellate at a lower resolution than what you would sculpt. So here's me sculpting, and then here's me smoothing. See how it kind of sculpting, smoothing? So it allows you to smooth at a less dense version. So if you don't like that, just change that to one or whatever ratio you'd like. Uh, but as of this recording, I just use both. I don't really, I don't do a lot of sculpting anymore. At Earthworm Gym is the first time I've sculpted something in a long time. Unfortunately. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll set that. I'm always weary to set it to 1080p, not so much for me, but for people watching the stream. But I can upload 1080p, it's just people downloading the 1080p in a stream is iffy. Um, cool, cool, cool. Um, John, you says ZBrush 2018 is amazing, you feel some things like the deformed menu is a bit convoluted. Um, maybe. I, I don't have a problem with it, but I could see how it might be a little overwhelming uh, with all those options. And it's one of those things, too, where, you know, anytime something new comes out in ZBrush, I already have a workflow set up, so I always think, like, wow, am I going to use this a whole lot? And then a year later, I'm like, oh, my God, I can't live without this. So it takes me even, even takes me a while to figure out what my flow is going to be with the new tools, especially if I don't use them a whole lot right up, right out of the gate. Uh, sometimes it takes me a while to actually come up with use cases to use them in my normal day-to-day, -day, if that makes sense. Uh, if I make a sculpt of sculptures, then I dynamesh the object to remesh to remesh the topology. Yeah, you can dynamesh. I would just use uh, remesh though. So we, we take this snake hook here, and then we want to make like a little weirdo creature. Um, one brush that came up when I was doing the octopus in the comments was if you hit the comma key, brush miscellaneous. There's a really cool brush in here I use sometimes, the spherical brush. Uh, you can use this, and this will pull out a kind of a, just a sphere out of your mesh. So you can, instead of like inserting a sphere using Project Primitive for a sphere, if you just need a sphere, you can sometimes use this brush. It's like I'm making boobs on this thing. Uh, you can use this here. So we'll go ahead and use it, hold down Alt, 
and then we can make it a little bit smaller. So again, instead of using project primitive, if you just need to make something real quick that's spherical, uh, you can use this brush. And then here, what we can do is we can go in here with the clay brush, and I'll just follow along with what we had here. And then we'll use our Damien standard, and we can kind of pull up in this area. I don't know what exactly this thing is. It's like some sort of little creature thing, which is fine. So what we can now do with our new deformers is you can uh, dynamesh this if you wanted to, uh, or you can just go straight into the zero mesher. So you can use your zero mesh properties um, however you'd like. Uh, you can also hit, uh, if we go in here to our gear, you're going to see we now have a uh, remesh by decimation, so you can just decimate, or you can zero mesh. Uh, you can do your union operations here with your booleans. You can dynamesh it, or you can project primitive. So if you wanted to dynamesh it first, you can certainly do that. If we turn on polyframe here, and we set this smoothness, reproject, no, zero is no. So it's at zero. And then over here we have our target polygon count, so we can just drag that up. And then as soon as you let go, it'll just dynam or dynamesh to that resolution. You're going to see it doesn't dynamesh once and then dynamesh again. It's just re-dynameshing from your original source mesh. So you're not losing anything. So you can dynamesh higher or lower, whatever resolution you want to kind of dial in. And then if you're happy with that, um, you can say, hit, okay, hit accept. Uh, also, like we were talking about, we can go uh, remesh by zero mesher. So here's our target polygon count. And then you can do X, Y, or Z symmetry over here. So we can say, I want a target polygon count of 50. And then you can just drop that in like so. And you can also drag the other way if you wanted to go lower than 50. And we'll do that in just a second. Give it a minute. Intensive operation. There we go. Hmm. That looks way lower than 50, though. I'll have to see what's up with that. Uh, how can you sculpt reliefs and plane changes on a flat surface without deforming it or getting holes with Dynamesh? Um, for reliefs in particular, the method I prefer to use is uh, projecting. So if you just if you just want to sculpt a relief on a flat piece of geometry, what I would do is go into, like, say, a cube here, make Polymesh 3D. And then on this cube, uh, we wanted to do, say, let's duplicate this off. Let's say bit, whoops, B, create insert mesh new. And now uh, we can go back to our cube here. If I drag my skull out, I want to do a relief of the skull from the three-quarter view. Instead of trying to sculpt that, what I would do is just squash it down. And we have an instant relief sculpture. So um, then if I wanted this on a plane, what I would do is I would put a plane in front of here. So uh, I guess I don't have a plane, but we can just do a cube for now. Let's go ahead and split those points. Delete hidden W, so we can put a plane in front of here. <clears throat> and then you can use your project brush. So if we go down here to geometry, I turn on smooth, and we just divide this thing up in order to have enough resolution. We can move all this stuff in front of here, and then you can use actually your matchmaker brush and go BMM, and then you can just pull through with your matchmaker brush. And, oops, that'll go ahead and capture any relief information. So we'll go ahead and put this back behind. And then now, as you pull through, it'll go ahead and project straight back that information. Um, another alternative to that is, let's go back to the skull here. Pull out another skull go to the three-quarter view, and then split mass points. Let's hit Control-D a couple times. Go into solo mode. 
we can have this on our canvas. Go out of edit mode, go up here, and we can do a MRGB Z grabber, and we'll just grab the skull. And now instead of so we got this one with the resolution plane here. There's our cube, there's our plane. Um, cube. Oh, there's our plane. Uh, now, since we have our plane here, we can just go into our standard brush, say drag rect, bring in that depth grab that we just created, and then focal shift down to negative 100, and then you can just drag on. So instead of sculpting a relief, you can just drag on your alphas. Um, but yeah, you're not going to want a dynamesh on a thin plane, or if you do, or if you are putting all this on a thin box, it's going to have to be high enough resolution to not go through here. Also, if this is what you're talking about, um, if we dynamesh all this together and you're going through and you're sculpting like this and dynameshing on something thin, this probably is what you're asking for. <laughs> After all that, uh, go over here to your brush, auto masking, and turn on back face. So now as you're sculpting through, it's going to ignore your back faces. Uh, stacking UVs for environments. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, someone else will have to weigh in on that one. Um, what I meant was, it, does it work for move type brushes? For example, IMM brushes. I mean, you can you can cycle through them automatically if you go to brush, insert. If I understand correctly, insert curve. Um, if you see these vines down here, so these are cycling randomly through all these vines. If you go over here to your stroke, uh, is it stroke or is it brush? Uh, modifiers, yeah, so brush modifiers, you have the variation selector set to 3, which is random, and then variation set to 4, and your multi-mesh selector set to 26. So when you go through here, it's going to number 26, cycling randomly through these four right here on your insert mesh brush. Um, radial symmetry tool, follow the mesh of my subtool without using the S pivot and having to move the subtool around to get the areas I would like to use radial symmetry on. Um, you can try turning on this LSIM button, I think. That might work for radial symmetry. It should. Um, hold on. Control on an axis constrains that axis and scales the other two. Can you do that in ZBrush? Z model? I couldn't figure that out. That makes sense. Um, hmm. That's a good one. I'm not positive about that. Uniform, or Non-uniformly scaling in two axes at the same time. I don't think you can, now that I think about it. Uh, I've seen Adobe Dimension yet. Do you know how it compares to Keyshot? I have seen it. If you go to my, I think my community page here, um, this AMD Ryzen Threadripper scene creation by Steve Talowski. Um, he does a Adobe Dimension thing that looks kind of cool. I haven't used it yet, but you can check that out. Uh, repair a corrupt file from ZBrush. Um, not that I, not that I can think of. If it won't load up at all, I mean, if it loads up, but you can't drag it out on your screen, you can sometimes go through here and do like a geometry fix mesh or delete what you might consider um, the problem subtool, and then save that out, and then try and bring it back in. Uh, but yeah, if it just if you try to load a Z tool, for example, or a file open project, um, I don't know if there's any settings or preferences in here that say clean up on import or anything like that. Uh, if I miss any, I'm kind of starting to go fast through these since I think I'm way behind. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um. Cool. Cool. Uh, I, um, 
Why is the brush crash when using on this and brushes to brush modifier projector strength turned up to 100? Uh, that I, I haven't run into that myself. Um, again, it might be might be the underlying mesh might be too complicated or something. Cool. Thank you for the kind words, Farhan Khan. Uh, da, 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 da. This is Zebras 2018. Um, cool, cool. All right, I think I'm getting caught up. Uh, any tips on restoring custom hotkeys? Sometimes I lose them and end up having to restart. Um, oh, you lose them while you're using ZBrush? Um, that's a little bit different. Uh, if I go here, you can reset all brushes underneath the brush menu. Um, under your preferences, hotkeys, you can load a hotkeys file, uh, your hotkeys.txt. I think ma, I think they're under your ZBrush data. Um, Z startup hotkeys. So here's the startup hotkeys. So I guess what you could do if you lose a hotkey. Now, here's the other thing too, is make sure you don't have caps lock on. Um, if you're using your hotkeys and you accidentally turn caps lock on, it's putting in a shift modifier to all your hotkeys, so then they won't work. So make sure that first, make sure your caps lock is off. Second, maybe use uh, load your ZBrush 2018 startup hotkeys uh, without restarting, or you can restart. Uh, is there a simple way to enable disable backface mask for all brushes? What I would do is say for the standard brush, let's go ahead and reset this thing. For this standard brush, I always want backface masking to be on for my standard brush. So what I do is I go have the standard brush selected, go to auto masking, turn on backface, and then go to brush, save as, and then again go over here to your ZBrush 2018. So this is program files, Pixel Logic ZBrush 2018. If you're on a Mac, sorry, whatever the equivalent of that is and then go into your Z data brush presets and then save over your um, standard brush here and then standard brush should always have your back face masking on. You could also record a macro of you going through your brushes and turning back face masking on for the one you want just run that on startup. Um, that's probably a little bit cleaner just to modify your default brushes to have back face turned on for the ones that you want. You don't want them on for all of them. Uh, your move brush, you probably don't want your back face masking turned on. Uh, way to create displacement maps with a higher resolution than 8K. Um, in ZBrush, there might be a, a weird way to do that. I'm not positive though. You might have to do 8K corners and then stitch it together externally. I don't know if you can do like a native 16 or 32K image in ZBrush, to my knowledge. Or if somebody with nano mesh might be able to cheat that system. Cool. Alrighty. So where do we leave off here? Let's see. Let's see. Delete all. And then move this stuff down. We probably won't get to too much armor today. Looking like... Um, I'm going to have to leave it like 7.30-ish. So we talk about zero measure here. I didn't quite get that figured out, but that's okay. I'll look at that next time. Uh, these, we can just, I'm just going through here and deleting all these. Oh, did we leave? Uh, okay, so we got this. I was loading up Substance Painter for some reason. Uh, if we want to look at this in the meantime, as soon as that thing gets out of the way, um, these are all just brought in from ZBrush using the ZBrush bridge into Keyshot. And the materials themselves, I think, were pretty simple too. I think I kept whatever they had and then just uh, modified them. Or did I change these things? I'm trying to remember. Oof. Metallic paint. I guess I did change these ones. Advanced. This one is like uh, bringing over the matte cap gray. <clears throat> And then just changing the diffuse spec here and ambient on this one. Uh, if we go over here to the environment, uh, this was a custom environment. So I talked about this a little bit on the Pixelogic live stream, or I guess I, I loaded it on mine as well. Um, so again, if you have, let's turn off all these here. So just so just so we have, uh, I guess we'll use, leave these rectangular ones on because, oh, it's locked. Let's unlock this one. And I turn those off. So um, right now in our scene, we have just our background, and then we also have a 
disk here. So if I have this disk selected and I say visible to camera, uh, you're just going to see I just have a disk sitting up here allowing me to dynamically light this thing without using my um, HDR images. Also, this thing right here is emissive. Yeah, that's emissive, so it's probably casting some sort of light nearby. So uh, with all this stuff, with our HDRI editor here, um, if you wanted a highlight in a specific area, you can just go to your HDRI editor and you can say add a pin. Then you can say um, control left mouse to add a highlight. So if I want to put a highlight right here, I can just control left click and then it should add a pin here, but it puts it in the rectangular pins, uh, which is turned off. So let's go ahead and turn that on. And let's go ahead and say pin number five is trashed. Okay, so doing that again, um, let's keep these on, but we'll turn all these off. So if I want to highlight over here, HDRI editor, we're going to say control left click, and that'll put a highlight right where I control left clicked, and that shows it what it is. And then over here, you can turn it into like a rectangular, make it bigger or smaller, change the color to a blue if you want to etc etc uh, and then you can just kind of build in a custom HDRI image lighting which is what I ended up doing I kind of started with maybe a simple one and then I went through and just added all these little custom lights as well as this light up here which I made invisible to camera set up my scene and the rest is history I suppose I don't know why ZBrush crashes a lot, especially during saving the scratch disk, have anything to do with that. Um, if it does have something to do with that, I'm not saying this is the case or not. Um, if you go here to your ZBrush data, um, you, do, you can set your scratch disk path to another drive if, it, if you do feel like that's um, causing problems. Oh, another thing too under quick save. This is something I think I set it accidentally to, well, let's let's look. Preferences, quick save. Um, I'm not sure what the default is. I think maybe it's 20. Uh, I had to set the 50 at work, and uh, I didn't realize I had set it to 50 at work, I guess. And uh, so watch this. Uh, you might be, depending on how heavy the files you're working on, might really be wreaking havoc with your hard drive space. Uh, substance to show the UVs of the hovership and painter. Yes, okay. So let's do that. Uh, we got this one. This one's out of here. Let's hop over to Substance Painter. Uh, substance Painter is running on your GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. It looks like your driver GPU is outdated. <laughs> okay. We'll continue for now. I'll, I'll update that later. Uh, let me make sure. Okay, so we can see that. Let's see if we can load up the... Load that up. Cool, so there's the uh, Houdini painter here. Uh, so this is the viewport version. So if you go over here, so if you're if you're using an old, or if you're going through old tutorials of Zebra uh, or Painter, um, this is probably going to look pretty foreign to you. Um, so your display settings are now up here, and then you can go through here with your camera settings and your viewport settings, or you can just scroll down like so. Uh, for example, we want to change the environment map. Let's go ahead and also your shadow. So I have shadows intensity turned on. Uh, you can change your shadow opacity here, and then your if you want to put in some field of field of view blur. Uh, post effects we have, I have anti-aliasing turned on, uh, which you may or may not want depending on what you're trying to create. Uh, color correction and a little bit of glare so we get these settings here so you can see the luminance of our glare is gonna, we can change that and also if we want to do like a lens flare instead of just a bloom we can do that as well. Um, vignette, lens distortion, blah blah blah. Uh, all this, oh here's the wireframe. So here's the wireframe of the ship. Let's go ahead and make that brighter white here. And then the wire from opacity, we can move that up or down. So uh, this is, so you can see it's a little bit denser back here. This is where we used our paint sop to dial in how dense we wanted our mesh. And then up front here, um, actually, now that I think about it, this might be the cinematic version 
So in the game res version, version this is this one right here. You're right. This one, I at the paint stop for the game version, I uh, did this heavier than this front one. But for the cinematic version, because I wasn't sure where I would be taking um, images from, I this is more of a u, uh, uniform density. You're right. This isn't the same one. Uh, but the pic te pixel density is fine. Um, I think I'm working right now at. Let me see what my texture set settings. I'm working at 2048 right now. Um, let's see, let's go back in here. Let's turn off wireframe here. So, you know, if I was to export this or render this, if I wanted to render it at like 4K, uh, I would just change this size here because I did bake my, or, yeah, 4096. I could just change that here. Uh, but I didn't feel really the need to. It held up fine. Uh, but like I said before, you could conceivably, since this is perfectly mirrored, just do a clip and then mirror, and then um, just use bake half of your mesh, and then overlap the others. Uh, just use that, do that in Houdini. For instance, um, yeah, let's go back to our uh, display settings here, environment map here. So here's our environment opacity, and then our blur. So here's our ship uh, flying around this environment. But yeah, like I said, you know, even going through here and using, just putting this stuff in, it's not great uh, resolution, but it was good enough for my purposes. Uh, if I wanted to, I could put this on a 4096, or you could export these. What I would do nowadays is these would just be decals, and then uh, the masks on these. So if we go back to our, uh, what am I looking for here? Layer. For example, where are steel scratched ends up. If I hold down Alt, you're going to see this is where all the steel scratched material goes. Um, black paint, orange paint, edge damages. So here's the edge damages um, for like the orange paint going to metal. What I would do is export this as a mask and then the, ex the orange paint as a mask. And then in say Unreal, you would have just a tiling material through your masks as opposed to just baking this out to a 4096. You would just export your masks like a 1024 and then tile the materials underneath those masks as much as you want to get the, so that way resolution only matters for your masks and you can dial that up and down and it's usually a little bit more forgiving and then you don't have to bake all that in. So anyway, long story short, uh, I wouldn't necessarily use this as a game. I would use this method for just a quick, like, throw it in the game and make sure it plays all right and, you know, go throw it in the engine and, you know, fly around. Um, but what I would end up doing is exporting those as masks and then just tiling materials through so I get infinite resolution on my materials. That'll always be, there we go. Um, that'll be as high resolution as the materials allow in the engine. And then my masks are the only thing that control the resolution. Uh, four hours for Earthworm Jim is mind blowing to me. It might have been five hours. It was. It was a. I would say it was about half a day, just kind of sitting down and using the new tools and recording it for the ZBrush beta. But uh, it's he's not. He's he. The good thing about him is that he's just sculptural. He's not uh, overly complicated. So this is just anatomy posed in a direction, you know. So it's not it's not anything too complicated. Um, let's turn all these off. And same thing with this eyeball. We'll turn that off for now. Yeah, so every, there's nothing really on him that's super complicated. It's just a matter of, and when it comes to organic sculpting, um, there's no real tricks, I guess. I mean, there are some brushes you can use and, and, you know, starting out with a base model like I kind of did. I used the Demo Soldier chest. No, I guess, you know, let's do this too. Got too many windows open here. So if you go to my, if you want to know what we're talking about, um, the Sculptors Pro Project Primitive Earthworm Gym, you got the fat beat. Um, so what we started out with was that demo soldier chest, just to have some of the base mesh. You could start out with a sphere, that's fine. It just saved me 15 minutes of blocking out a chest and then going through, and let me turn that music off. Um, 
and then using project printed for the muscles, which you don't have to do. You can just use a clay brush. Project printed is nice because it keeps it nice and contained. So if you're doing like stylized modeling, you would normally use like an insert mesh brush and kind of put those things around. Uh, project printed just allows you to kind of skip the insert mesh part. Um, insert mesh brushes in some instances might give you more of a um, more control sometimes, but it's kind of up to you. And this is us again using project printed for the eyeballs. And then uh, for the mouth, too, you can do that. Uh, you just make a shape, and then you use the dots to squeeze it into that shape, and then taper it. And then same thing for the teeth, all project primitive, which again, you can use insert mesh brush, but project primitive is sitting there, and it's easy, so give that a shot. And then making the straps, I tried to use polygroup it. Speaking of polygroup it, um, that's another cool thing here. Take the sphere, make poly mesh 3D. Uh, for instance, if we have Sculptures Mode turned on with our standard brush, dot stroke, let's go to brush. There we go. So we got our standard brush here, and we turn Sculptures Mode on, and now we can sculpt with high resolution. And like I mentioned before, if you have just RGB on, you can go through here. Let's do a fill color. And then I want to make like armor patterns on here. Uh, we can just go through and we can say, I want a this piece here. And then I want another armor piece here. And again, you can hold down shift if you want to snap to a straight line. But it looks like it doesn't play nice. So make your lazy mouse longer. There you go. So anyway, um, and then we'll do one more. Alrighty, so this is my armor pieces that I want. So what I can do now is we can go over here to our Z plugin, and we can say polygroup it. Now, if you go into polygroup it, it's going to be based on the sculpting of your model, which we'll get to in a minute. But if we do polygroup it from paint borderless, what it's going to do is it'll go through and look at your poly paint. And then if we turn off line, you're going to see what it did and turn off poly paint. You're going to see it gave me a polygroup right down the middle of the black areas that I painted. So here's one polygroup, another polygroup, and another polygroup. Uh, make this more obvious. Let's hit Control W. There we go. Um, so there's that. If we hit Control W, that'll make it all one polygroup again. And then we have our poly paint turned on. If we do it uh, with a border, it'll go through and it'll give us a polygroup border where we have that paint. So here's one polygroup, another polygroup another polygroup, and then our border. Um, and then if we hit Control W and get rid of that poly paint, and we have no poly paint, and we go through here, and we use our Damien Standard Brush, and we say, I want these things to be polygrouped. You can go through here, and you're just doing your normal armor sculpting. block out or whatever. And then you can go over here and if you want to you can also like H polish this, these corners here. See I like to use a big H polish brush and so I need to probably set the settings for this brush in particular to play nice with how I like to use H polish. It's totally customizable so it's not a big deal. We got our armor like this and then uh, we can go into polygroup it. And then we can say Wait for it. There we go. Let me get my key here. Okay, so we can put a um, polygroup it. Let me just use my mouse here. Polygroup a dot in here, and then as you drag the slider up, it'll start growing that polygroup based on your uh, geometry. You can say extend. Um, since we put extend on and there's no other polygroups, it's going to extend all the way across your mesh. If we put another one over here, and we kind of dial this one in, it'll extend to those borders here. So you can use this to kind of go and look at your mesh, underlying mesh pieces, and it'll just like extend out. So we'll go ahead and drop this back. Actually, let's turn extend off temporarily. So we're going to go here and then here, and then this, since we had extend on, green was going everywhere. So let's put another dot here, and there we go. And we know it will extend this out. And now we'll turn extend on, and now we're getting these polygroups where we want them. So you can put these wherever you want, however you'd like, hit OK. And then when we come back in, we now have those polygroups placed on our geometry.
Uh, Garrett says, well, can you show us how to set up a master shader in Unreal? Um, sure. Let me, I'll have to brush up on that. There's some, what, what, what I end up doing is using what they set up at work. Our material team sets all that stuff up at work. So I know how it works. I just don't know if I could like, at this point, walk you through step by step exactly how to set that up. I need more practice. So it might take me a bit. Cool. Um, uh, watch your Houdini tutorial about creating uh, lower resolution spaceships. Do you prefer Houdini over ZBrush for Retopo? Uh, depends on what I'm making. So for animation type things like this, I would still probably use ZRemesher just because, I mean, you can use, um, what's the other one? InstaMesh, Instant Mesh. Uh, in Houdini, it's, it's, it, it's plugged into Houdini, so you can use that as an alternative. Uh, there's a video on that. But for this kind of geometry in particular, um, Zero Mesh is really nice for like animatable stuff. As far as, far as poly reduce it, or poly reduce, that's the same thing, kind of same thing as decimation. So if you were using decimation in ZBrush, I would just use poly reduce it in Houdini. I mean, Z decimation master in ZBrush is fine if you don't want to leave ZBrush. Um, but if you want just a little bit more control, um, you can go and use Houdini. So I guess I might prefer Houdini in that sense, but I still use Decimation Master and ZBrush all the time. And if you want the man, anybody else watching who may or may not know, um, if you want more info on that, if you go to my playlists and we go down to the uh, sci-fi sci -fi pistol series, I can link you guys to this. This one goes through the manual method, and it's not doesn't take that long. But if you wanted to do ZBrush and decimate all to a certain polygon account polygon amount, you can do that under uh, Z repeat it and decimate all. These things should this I think I went over like your total poly count, and then decimating to a percentage based on that. So you can use ZBrush instead of Houdini to dial in your percentages and do the for each loop. Cool. Um, cool. All righty. Thanks for showing up, Ruth. All right. Have a good. Have a good sleep. This. Uh, can I use ZBrush with a mouse and get amazing results? Uh, I use ZBrush with a mouse for like Z modeler type operations. Uh, if you want to get sculpting, and if you want to use like say the H polish brush, for example, um, with a mouse. Oh, um, sculptor's mode turned off. Um, so H polish brush with a mouse is a little bit harder to control. Uh, there are some brushes in ZBrush, like yeah, that that need a little bit more of a feather touch. Whereas in here, I can hold down Alt and just kind of dial in really quickly. So if you wanted to do um, anything sculptural in ZBrush, uh, not using a tablet might be a tall order because it is a very, you know, pressure sensitive. It's a sensitive program. Uh, I'm going to use Topo Gun to retopologize as my model for my portfolio since zero measure is not in ZBrush Core. At, I mean, that's that's another alternative too. And you can also use um, if you do if people who are using zero measure, you can start out with uh, zero measure and then you can update it. I can I can link you guys to that video. Um, that'll be live stream highlights. And there's a Ant eater in here, where he is. Uh, Zero mesh Z sphere topology cleanup. So you can use Zero mesher in conjunction with Z spheres and knock yourself out. Can you paint in ZBrush where you want a less dense area for decimation master like you can for Zero mesher? Yeah. Yeah, you can, I think. Use and keep poly paint, poly paint weight. You can use your poly paint to weight it, so you can um, paint in areas where you want it to keep it. So you can say, uh, when I, let's see if this works. Standard brush. No, not damn standard, standard brush. Okay. 
So I want this to be more. So let's go ahead and delete higher. And I want to say decimation master preprocess current. And then I want to wait. Use and keep polypaint. Polypaint weight says to 25 preprocess current. And now if I decimate this down to say 10k, it'll weight it 25%. Now let's say if we polypaint weight this to 100%. Okay, so it weights the edges of the poly paint, the transition areas in between. Hmm. Hmm, 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 hmm. I want to say you can mask too. Let's try that. So let's say I have this masked. Preprocess current. Okay, so you can use masking to leave this stuff alone. Uh, and then if you wanted to say mask this at a lower percentage, you could say um, RGB intensity down. So when you mask, no. Oh, hold on, control RGB intensity down. And then mask this at like 18%. Boy, that is full. Um, that's a tougher one. Again, it's not quite as, let's see, pre-process, and then 10K again. I mean, that, that kind of does it. So you can dial in the resolution of your, or the density of your mask to dictate, but it's not nearly as controllable as, uh, you know, putting your paint sop. And you could, in you know, that paint sop that we did in Houdini was just, uh, fairly simple. You could make that as complex as you wanted, or as much control as you wanted. Um, in Houdini, just put dialing in your parameters. Thanks for the kind words, Jonas. Um, you really need to put in really low music. Uh, every time I've gone into live stream comments on other channels, they're always like, get rid of that damn music. It's, it's not good. <laughs> so... I think I talk way too much for music, uh, but if I ever get into, hey, we're just going to sit here and have a good time sculpting some happy trees, then definitely I'll throw some music back behind me. But, I mean, I don't know if you'd... And also, what you could do is uh, put on music you like to listen to, because Lord knows uh, there's some music out there that I would want to listen to while I'm watching somebody. So what I can do, since I'm on my computer or on my phone, I can just have music playing in the background myself. Um, yeah, but I would definitely say get a, get a tablet. All right, come up on five minutes left. Um, keep polypaint options available in new decimation to form as well. Really handy. Oh, good point. I forgot about that. Um, so yeah, like we were talking about earlier, um, the remesh, remesh by decimation. Uh, let's see what options we got in here. So we got, uh, polypaint weight. Okay, perfect. So now, again, that I think that is just your border of your poly paint, but there is a weighting uh, assigned in there, and then use poly painting to turn on and off here. So keep UVs protected borders. Yeah, it's all right in there. So we can say, decimate this down, I'm raise it up a little bit. So now this one's a little bit more interactive, I suppose. Instead of having to drag that slider around, you can just go through here, and you can, it doesn't update visually on the fly, but it's a little bit faster. Uh, other useful plugins that I use, uh, Curves Helper. I'm going to do a, a proper video on this. Uh, it always comes up like, how do I can how do I control my curves? Um, I've touched on it in my live streams a lot, but I'm going to do a whole video series on just the Curves Helper. Uh, Z repeated I use a lot. Um, that IMM, the Clean Tool Master, I use a lot too. Um, when I'm going to bake, I'll do my dynamic subdivision to subdivisions all. Go through here and do cleanup operations. Um, I'm an extractor I use a lot. I think that's about it. Transpose master sometimes, UV master sometimes. See, so repeat it for batch operations. Yeah. Um, have you ever used 3D Coder or Topogun in your workflow? Um, 
yes, it's been a while. Uh, again, I'm way too lazy to sit there and manually plot points if I can help it, so Ziri Mesher is usually good enough with a little bit of cleanup, or just decimation, and or polyreduce in Houdini. Um, or I can use these spheres. Uh, I've used Modo, Maya, uh, Topo Gun. I haven't used 3D Code for topology, but I hear it's great. It's uh, At that point, I think at this point, unless somebody comes up with the magic bullet of how to get topology done automatically, it's just one method or another of dragging out edge loops and adding points and having it snap to the surface and moving things around and adding more edge loops and snapping points and moving things around and adding more edge loops until um, until you pay somebody else to do your topology for you. <laughs> yeah, well, eventually, one of these days, uh, soon, I think, uh, in order to get actual, if we want to make forward progression on anything, uh, we'll have to sit here and just, I'll have to be like, hey, I'll answer a couple questions once an hour uh, if we want to actually get some really heavy-duty sculpting done or asset creation done. So right now what we have is a skeleton sitting inside of a body. So let's go ahead and uh, think about this. Let's hit, let's just merge all these down. So this will be our Nick Z body here. And then I'm going to append our merged uh, Ryan Kingsline female. And then we're going to append our Ryan Kingsline skeleton. So we're going to use all three of these. And for these two down here, I'm going to say deformation unify and another deformation unify. So uh, we can start with these three characters and we'll do various uh, ways to kind of make a zombie creature, put clothing on them, do some armor. That's all the really fun stuff. And again, like I said, we can do some really fun, cool uh, blackout stuff. And we've got our book um, here. So <laughs> we can use this as a prop and then we'll go ahead and finish this thing out. Um, if you've missed that, that'll be on our live stream full episodes here. Let me back out here. Uh, so live stream full episodes, if you go back through here, you can see us working on, oops. Oh, shoot. What did I just do? What is that? I click the clock. Um, yeah, so you can go through here and you can see um, what we ended up doing and how we ended up. And we used Houdini for this one too, just to get it through. And then uh, we threw it into Painter and painted it up. Speaking of. And uh, before, okay. Uh, can ZBrush totally replace 3D Studio Max Maya yet? Totally. Uh, depends on what you're using. If you're just modeling like me, it can. I haven't used my R Max to model anything in a while. Uh, I say about six years. But if you want to do like animation stuff, then yeah, I still use Maya. Cool. Uh, Sketch Retopo software. Um, I think I saw something about. Yeah, I think I saw a YouTube video on that. Cool. Uh, oh yeah, on the uh, stream about opacity too. Uh, glad that worked out. That's just basically changing your shader. If you missed that one, um, this default material here, if you want to make something opaque, or um, not opaque, but uh, transparent, uh, you got to go into your material here, and you got to change it from PBR Metal Rough to PBR Metal Rough uh, Alpha alpha blending. And then once you have that, you'll have a texture setting in here. So you can say your texture set and then you're going to add opacity. So now that you have an opacity channel, now when you go in here and you add a fill layer on this fill layer, let's go ahead and say um, we want this to show up. So we'll add a black mask and then we're just going to make the edges opaque. So I'm going to add a generator here and in this generator we'll go ahead and select uh, metal edge wear. So now this layer is only showing up on the edges where it's worn. And then if we go into this fill layer here and we say uh, add an opacity channel, which we have, and then under opacity, we can actually dial that down. So now we are transparent inside of this. And if we want to say invert this, we can invert that. And now only the edges are showing up. So that was the opacity thing we went over. Cool. Can you make any Dragon Ball Z characters? That might, you know what, I'll add that to my streaming. You know, doing kind of fan art stuff is actually a lot easier than trying to design my own stuff. 
real time for sure because you just it's kind of like the earthworm gym you're just looking at something and then recreating it's a lot easier than trying to design it on the fly so i can add that to my streaming topics i never actually watched dragon ball z so i'm about to do a little bit of research um, let's see let's go ahead and save that off uh, does Houdini auto retopo produce topology, which is fine with a lot of reflections and metallic surfaces? Um, the way it's set up now, probably not. Um, although you could, uh, you know, really for the reflective surfaces, about the capturing the normal information from the vertices to get those to shade correctly. So there's probably something you can do there. Um, or if you want to get really fancy, you could set up some sort of like you know, sub D zero mesh solution within Houdini to retopologize as well. I'm sure it's coming, you know. Uh, what do you think about Cinema 4D? Um, I've never used it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's just, um, same thing with 3D Studio Max. I haven't used 3D Studio Max in about 10 or 12 years, probably maybe a little bit longer, but it's not that it's a bad program. It's just that I haven't had any reason to use it. So I got to pick and choose my battle sometimes. Alrighty. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save all this stuff. So we're going to save this book. Uh, let's see, where were we at? We were streaming Medieval Zombie book. We're going to say, um, our placeholder here, and then all these bodies, we'll save these ones into um, our zombies folder. Zombie zero zero one. Okay, so I think we're all caught up. Alrighty. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, thanks everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and head out. And uh, this live stream will be up on YouTube soonish. It takes sometimes it takes a little bit longer to process than other days, but we'll see. I uh, use Substance Designer at all, been using it extensively, just created my new alpha pack, and it's God's gift. Yeah, I used to use it a lot. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll have a really old walkthrough of Substance Designer uh, workflow pipeline stuff. But um, it's been a while since I've been in there to create anything. It's been a while since I've created anything at all. So, all right, let's see. Go get a. We'll see. We'll see how fast. And that'll be another uh, stream where I would basically be like, hey, I'm just going to be sculpting. So, good luck keeping up and I won't be answering a ton of questions but you know sometimes that's okay let's see streaming topics I'll add that we'll give it a shot cool thanks everybody I'm gonna head out and see you